So as we were driving here this morning, going along Okanagan Lake, in our conversation, I said something to Kevin along the lines of, well, this is one of those mornings where the sermon is just coming together on Sunday morning. I know I should never admit that. <laughs> oh, well. But I have to tell you, this is even fresher because I got all inspired by some of the conversation we had at the 8.30 service, so we'll see how things go. But let me start with something from last night. We watched Saturday Night Live last night. I almost never watch it because usually it's on really late, but I've discovered on Global it comes on earlier. So we're watching it, and I was reminded something about jokes, right? A good joke, of course, always has a story and then a punchline, and everybody laughs. But if you don't get the joke, you don't laugh, right? There's nothing to it. There was a comedian on last night who, well, just wasn't really funny. And he kept looking for laughs, and they didn't really happen. And while I felt very badly for the guy, I also thought, you're not funny, stop, get off the stage. Um, parables, though, are different from that. Parables are kind of like jokes, because they always have something funny slash shocking in them. Always. That's one of the tricks of a parable. It's got to have something that makes you go, what? But there are also lots of different ways to understand them and to hear them. And I think Jesus knew that when he taught in parables. Frequently he would share stories knowing that people would hear it differently depending on what they needed to hear at the time for what was going on in their life and the world around them. So I want to talk briefly about some of the ways we might hear this parable that Joa shared this morning. And she did threaten me that she was going to add yet another interpretation because she was going to add a fourth servant who invested the money and lost it all. But we chose not to go there, which is good. You might have noticed, though, in the, the version that Joa read, it talked about dollars. And that's why we chose this translation, because often we read this and it talks about talents, right? How many people have ever heard of this, the parable of the talents? Yeah. And it's often understood, we think of what, how we use the word talent in English today, right? And so we understand it, something along the lines of God gives us all talent and we must not waste it. So if you can paint paintings, you should paint paintings. And if you can play the guitar or the piano or the bagpipes, you should play them. And use the talents that God gives you and it would be a shame to waste those. And that's a wonderful interpretation except for the fact that it doesn't have the word talent in it, in the original. I mean, it does, but it doesn't. It has the Greek word talentia, which gets tra transliterated as talent because when they were working on the King James Bible, they didn't know what a talent was. So they just decided to transliterate it. It's a unit of money. That's all it ever was in Greek. A talent was a unit of money. So despite all the wonderful interpretations we've probably heard over the years that have inspired us to go out and learn the bagpipes and try painting and using our talents, this story has absolutely nothing to do with that. It is a story about money. But even then, there's lots of things we can do with it. Someone shared at the 830 service, this was an interesting interpretation, that someone spoke about how in South Africa in the time of apartheid, this story was told and people would understand and would, would resonate with the third servant. Because the third servant had the strength to stand up to power and say, I'm not going to do what you told me to do. And so they would hear this parable as a strong reminder of the importance sometimes of just standing up and saying no. I'm not going to do it, of, as we tend to say these days, of speaking truth to power. And so it becomes a power, wonderful story about standing up for what you believe in. Another interpretation is that this is one, uh, this is the middle part of a bigger parable. Uh, last week we talked about the story of the wise and the foolish maidens, right? The bridesmaids. And they all went to wait for the bridegroom who didn't show up. 
and some of them didn't have enough oil, and so some of them got left out. And next week, the lectionary gives us the story that comes right after today's, and it's one that you probably all know. It's the story uh, that Jesus told where he said, at the end of time, a king came in and he divided the sheep and the goats, right, and said to the sheep, you took care of me when I, when I needed you to, and they said, we didn't do that. And Jesus said, yes, you did. Every time you cared for the least, for the poorest, for the starving among you, you cared for me. And said to the goats, you didn't care for me. And just like the sheep, they go, we didn't do it. And Jesus said, when you didn't care for the least and the poorest and the most needy among you, you didn't care for me. So one scholar sees this as one big, long parable, as if Jesus said in the story last week and in today's story, so let me give you a couple examples of what the world is like. The world says, if you come prepared, you get in, and if you're not prepared, out you go. And the world says, if you invest your money and make lots, you get rewarded, and if you don't, out you go. But Jesus says, no, I'm not going to judge you like that. I'm going to judge you on how you care for the poorest and the least and the neediest among you. That's kind of a neat interpretation, too. Well, the last one I want to share is one that I really like. It picks up on the fact that Jesus is talking here about money. He, he does use the, the Greek word, as I mentioned, talentia, which means about 15 years' wages. Okay? So it's, not, it's even way more than $5,000 here. Take 15 years' salary. That's a lot of money. And that's just one to lend you. So the first person is given 75 years' worth of money. So we're talking about a million dollars, give or take a few hundred thousand. Once the numbers get that big, who cares, right? So this fellow's given about a, a million dollars. Now immediately, the people hearing this parable would have gone, huh, what? Nobody gives you a million dollars when they go away. The second guy gets about 30 years worth of salary. The last guy still gets 15 years worth of I mean, there's a lot of money that we're talking about here. When the guy comes back, this is the fun part, when the master comes back and the first one says, hey, I took your million bucks and I doubled it, he says, oh good, if I can trust you with a little amount like that, I can trust you with a big amount. Sort of like when, when Donald Trump said he started with nothing, only $8 million. The sadness is, I think he meant it. The fellow says, I can trust you with a little amount. And we're going, <laughs> I don't think of, you know, five million bucks as a little amount, but okay. And then to the second one, who took his, his two million, he doubled it as well. And he says, this is great, you did it. And the last one, and in most translations, they make him out a little less nice than he shows up in this version. And he basically says, I knew that you were mean. And I was scared of you, so I hid your money. And that's the one that the master doesn't like. That seems a little odd. Why would he get left out? Except, remember it's a parable, so it's, it's got lots of different ways to understand it. And maybe what Jesus is meaning here is this has something to do with how we view and understand God. The first one is given this massive amount of God's grace and experiences God as an amazing, loving, forgiving being. And the second one, the same thing. And the third one, frankly, still gets a pretty hefty amount of grace here. Fifteen years' salary all at once is nothing to sneeze at. Trust me. He's given a huge amount, but he doesn't notice it. And he's got blinders on, and he sort of goes, I know God is being mean and nasty and horrible and terrible. And that's it. And when we think of God that way, when we have a very limited, very minute view of God, we tend not to share that. If you understand God as being mean and nasty and judgmental and having that proverbial finger that gets pointed at whoever... I don't know about you, that's not really an image of God that I would want to rush out and share, you know? 
But if I'm realizing that God is the one who is pouring out grace upon grace upon grace on me and on you, I want to share that news. I want to take that, that five million measures of grace and go running out and say to people in the marketplace, there is a God who loves you no matter what you think about yourself and no matter what other people think of you. God loves you. God cares about you. You are awesome. As Cheryl was sharing, you are a wonder. So we are invited to hear this parable in any one of these or numerous other ways. And I especially like that last one. I like the idea of hearing this as God pours out grace on us, lavishes it on us way more than we could ever imagine or ever think we need, and then God keeps doing it. And I don't know about you, but I think that that is news worth sharing. Thanks be to God.